Welcome back to Rafford Reading Daily. We are embarking on a new journey. I'm not sure what episode you will find this in. <clears throat> Part of this new journey is going to be I'm going to begin re- reading multiple books at a time. I'm going to begin going out of my way to read some pieces of literature with different people, even if it's just a portion, reading it with somebody. So I'm going to have a and alternate between a book where I'm individually reading and then a book where each episode I'm reading in coordination with somebody or at least having a conversation with somebody about the things that I'm reading. So this sort of marks something like a change in the way that Rock for Reading is being conducted and I hope it's or really an evolution and I hope to continue to evolve this as we go forward. So we are going to begin reading Sister Citizen by Melissa V. Harris Perry. This, of course, will be an individual reading. Uh, this book is uh, is titled Sister Sister Citizen Shame Stereotypes in Black Women in America Uh, and I'm not going to do too much talking about the book I'm just going to dive right into it I've never read this before Introduction So the beginning of this was a woman and she had come back from burying the dead not the dead of sick and ailing with friends at the pillow and the feet She had come back from the sodden and the bloated, the sudden dead, their eyes flung wide open in judgment. Zora Neale Hurston, their eyes were watching God. If you ask most people what they think of when they hear the word politics, they are likely going to give a definition that includes voters, parties, elections, public policy, and processes of consternation and representation. But formal participation in government is only one part of a more encompassing effort to be recognized within the nation. The struggle for recognition is the nexus of human identity and national identity, where much of the most important work of politics occurs. African-American women fully embody this struggle. By studying the lives of black women, we gain important insight into how citizens yearn for and work toward recognition. To understand black women's politics, we must explore their often unspoken experiences of hurt, rejection, faith, and search for identity. Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God takes on the task of understanding the heart of a woman and thereby exposes meaningful political truths about hierarchy, oppression, and liberation. The goal of this book is a similar exploration. It is therefore not the kind of book you might expect from a political scientist. This book is not about black women who hold elected office or about the choices of African-American women in the voting booth. It is not about black women's community organizing, protest activities, or policy choices. Rather, this book makes the claim that the internal, psychological, emotional, and personal experiences of black women are inherently political. They are political because black women in America have always had to wrestle with the derogatory assumptions about their character and identity. These assumptions shape the social world that black women must accommodate or resist in an effort to preserve their authentic selves and to secure recognition as citizens. This is less a book about what black women do to become first-class American citizens than one about how they feel while they are in that struggle. A good place to start this exploration of black women's internal politics is with the extraordinary 1937 novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, by the anthropologist, essayist, folklorist, and playwright, Zora Neale Hurston. It does not seem like an overtly political text, but in many ways it is emblematic of the racial and gender politics that we observe in contemporary American politics. Hurston's protagonist, Janie Mae Crawford, is a black woman living in the rural South in the years after World War I. It is a classic heroic tale in which Janie... Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. Be safe. Have a good night. Oh, it's all good. Have a good night. Would you take my change? I will. I will. Thank Thank you. We appreciate it. Yeah, have a good night. Stay safe.
All right, we outside, we outside. Just had a few people passing by Saturday night. Well, I guess technically Sunday morning. Technically Sunday morning. It's a beautiful night out. Beautiful morning out. It does not seem like an overtly political text, but in many ways it is emblematic of the racial and gender politics that we observe in contemporary American politics. Hearst's protagonist, Janie Mae Crawford, is a black woman living in the rural South in the years after World War I. It is a classic heroic tale in which Janie confronts the distorted expectations of others and discovers her authentic self. Because Janie's journey focuses her to grapple, excuse me, because Janie's journey forces her to grapple with limiting gender and race roles that constrain her, their eyes were watching God is more than a tale of achieving self-knowledge. It is a narrative that actively questions issues of power, prejudice, and human fulfillment. Hurston takes Janie on a quest for self-understanding, a quest that is expressed in her efforts to find an authentic, loving relationship in an unpredictable and threatening world where her black womanhood makes her vulnerable to people and systems that seek to transform her into a beast of burden. As a young woman, she learns that her assigned role is to serve as a mule, carrying the weight of racial prejudice and gender inequality. Quote, So do white men throw down the load and tell the nigger man to pick it up? He pick it up because he have to, but he don't tote it. He hand it to his women folks. The nigger woman is the mule to the world so far as I can see. End quote. Janie's journey is a political one because it is motivated by her refusal to accept this role. As she seeks personal freedom, Janie struggles to be recognized by her grandmother, her husband, and her community for all of who she is and not only for things that her embodied black womanhood represents. She survives a loveless marriage, arranged while she was still a child, and then a privileged but brutal existence with existence with her status-conscious second husband. Ultimately, she discovers a sensual, mutually fulfilling love affair with the much younger tea cake. Although framed by love, this story is about more than romance. Janie must discard the limiting roles that others seek to have her fulfill. She refuses to be the world's mule, but learns how much she enjoys physical labor of her own choosing. She discovers that even if she was offered a position at the top of a hierarchy, she prefers egalitarian interactions. Janie learns to express her own wit and intelligence, even if her ideas disappoint or scandalize others. In the end, she learns that she must preserve herself, even if doing so is painful. These lessons are as much about the collective struggles of black women seeking their own freedom as they are about an individual black woman's quest to find fulfillment. As the text draws to its climax, Hurston places Janie at the center of a storm. Janie and Tea Cake are living in a town in the Florida Everglades. Their life is marked by poverty and hard work, but also by companionship and community. In their second season there, they listen as Native Americans predict a major storm and watch as they begin to leave for high uh, lead the belief for higher ground. O U S Glamorous. Oh, is that the that's the Jack Harlow song First I was playing? Class. I see. Up in the sky. I see. I like Kendrick Lamar a lot more than Jack Champagne. Harlow. Champagne. I wish he was reading reading Kendrick Leading Lamar lyrics. Life. I wish these was Kendrick Lamar On lyrics. On the fast lane. No, not Jack Harlow. Not Jack Harlow. Listen to more Kendrick Lamar. Glamorous. No, in '95. Go On listen the to fantasy. No, listen to Kendrick fantasy. Lamar. Go listen to Kendrick Lamar. It's fantasy. better for you. I would not be reading. It's that. better for you. What? what what's your favorite song? I'll look it up. What's your favorite song? In 95, Kendrick Lamar. In 95? In 95. Like the mask? Yeah, like the mask. What's it about? I can't tell you. Then I'll give away the song. It's a no, surprise. No, no, yeah, the no. element of surprise. If it's bad quality. Yeah, yeah, but the it's element of surprise is important. It does. Like, I'm if it's quality, it's got a good meaning, right? It does. It does have no, a great so meaning. No, what's it about? No, that, that's part of the surprise if of the I'm song. If I'm going to look it up. In 95, Kendrick Lamar. If I'm going to look it up. In 95. No, 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 no. I'm curious. In 95, Kendrick Lamar. In 95, Kendrick Lamar. Okay. All right. Okay. So if you spice it up, what's your favorite song other than that? Uh, like something, like a different kind of genre. A different type of genre. Let's see. Uh, I like Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones? What's yeah. your favorite song? Uh, 
The one when he's singing about no, being no, the no, devil. No, no, no. We're just hanging out. What's the one when he's singing about being the devil? They play it in movies a lot. No, I don't know. Oh, That's damn. not like, usually <laughs> my genre. You're gonna uh, get carried away. I like away. Taylor Swift. So I like Taylor you, Swift. Are you? We belong uh, doing together. A podcast. Yes, yeah, so, uh, reading. We read. What's, Read a just, book, read a piece wait, of a book, stop, talk stop, about stop. the book. No, I'm actually curious. Is it like reading, um, you know, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> I'm just, no, I'm, I'm curious. I'm kind of like. Sidewalk is storage. I don't think that's legal. It is legal. Come on. No, um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see where we're at. All right, let's see. Uh, okay. In their second season there, they listen, they listen as Native Americans predict a major storm and watch as they begin to leave for higher ground. Soon others evacuate too, but Janie, Tea Cake, and their friend Motorboat are among those who decide to stay and ride out the storm. That night and the next day, the storm builds. Quote, They huddled closer and stared at the door. They didn't use another part of their bodies, and they didn't look at anything but the door. The time was passed for asking the white folks what to look for through that door. Six eyes were questioning God. The wind came back with triple fury and put out the light for the last time. They sat in company with others in other shanties, their eyes straining against crude walls and their souls asking if he meant to measure their puny might against his. They seemed to be staring at the dark, but their eyes were watching God. End quote. Finally, the dikes of Lake Okachabee burst and the waters began to take over the town. Janie and TK try to flee. They must swim past drowned animals, dead bodies, and massive destruction. Janie is attacked by a rabid dog and saved by TK. At least they reach the city of Palm Beach where chaos and destruction await them. TK is forced to assist in clearing the bodies of the dead. The work is not only vile and difficult, but also profoundly racist. White corpses are given coffins, while black ones are left in a mass grave, covered with quicklime. The racial hierarchy, made obvious during the storm when whites occupied high ground while forcing blacks into the dangerous, low-lying land below, is reinforced by these burials. For today's readers, Hurston's flood evokes the devastation of New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. In the years since the storm, Hurricane Katrina has become a familiar metaphor, a fashionable tool by which media commentators measure every political catastrophe faced by a presidential administration. Because catastrophes like Katrina, excuse me, because catastrophes like Katrina focus public attention, reveal institutional shortcomings, and evoke powerful emotional responses, they are easily reduced to casual metaphor. But I want us to try to recapture the initial horror of the tremendous human loss and emotional trauma caused by the storm. Before Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans was a place where, like Janie and the Everglades, many black people lived with poverty and struggle, but also with community and with deep historical and familial connections, and where they made distinctive cultural contributions. This unique black community was severely damaged in August 2005. The order to evacuate came fewer than 24 hours before the hurricane made landfall. On the day of the evacuation order, more than one in four individuals in New Orleans lived below the federally defined poverty line, and more than a quarter of New Orleans residents did not own private vehicles. As the quarter of New Orleans resident, excuse me, as the storm approached, more than 30,000 people fled to shelters in the city Superdome and Convention Center. Those who lacked the resources to get themselves or their families out were forced, like Janie, Tea Cake, and Motorboat, to endure the storm in their homes. New Orleans was spared a direct hit, and the city might have swiftly recovered from the extensive, but manageable, damage caused by wind and rain. Yet in the hours after the storm passed, several critical levees failed. As in Hurston's novel, the broken levees unleashed lake waters with frightening force and speed. In vulnerable neighborhoods, there was little warning and no means of escape. Stranded, the people waited for relief and rescue that, for days, did not come. The power went out and the floodwaters rose. Food and water became scarce. The city's shelter became centers of disease, hunger, and death. 
For three days, the victims of the storm were left to manage on their own. As they waited, President George W. Bush shared a birthday cake with Senator John McCain, visited a senior citizen's home, gave a speech on the war in Iraq, and played the guitar with the popular country singer. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice shot for shoes in New York City and took in a Broadway show. FEMA director Michael Brown sent lighthearted inter-office emails about which shirt and tie he should wear during his live television appearance about the disaster. Despite aggressive and continuing coverage of the destruction on cable news, it seemed that federal government, government officials refused to recognize what was happening in New Orleans. The contrast between the urgency of the disaster and the paucity of the initial response led many observers to question what caused this inability to see what was happening. As in Hurst's novel, the storm was a dispassionate and impersonal force, but its destruction was not shared equally. Before the storm, New Orleans was a predominantly African-American city, and those left in the wake of the hurricane were disproportionately black. Almost exclusively, it was the suffering of black people that was broadcast to a national viewing audience. Poor and black citizens found themselves both more vulnerable to the disaster and less able to recover in its aftermath. Even in the earliest days of the disaster, observers began to note the ob not, observers began to note the obvious racial inequality. Okay, here let's take a second to reflect here. Uh, this is a longer introduction. This is a long introduction. I might have said this in a different episode that I've done this, but I usually don't even read introductions when I read books. Not that it's a uh, no real. No real inherent reason that I don't. Just not something that I tend to do. But uh, let's see. What am I thinking? Okay, let me get something to drink. Okay, so that was a crazy beginning to this episode. And I think that's something that... No, nah, I think that is something that will definitely begin to happen more. Uh, really, I begin to do these Rock for Reading daily episodes at the... In the fall, in the winter, primarily. So I haven't really had a chance. I mean, I would do some when it was warm out. When, I mean, it was warmer for some of them that I did when I was out. But for the most part, we've been doing these things in the cold. And so between it being in the cold and then sometimes being in a house or in a, a closed-in environment, there hasn't been a lot of disruption from people coming, passing by in comparison to what it can be and what it will be. Now that the spring has is is in full bloom and the summer is on the way, there will be racist people that will come by while I'm reading. There will be police supporters that will come by. There will be probably police officers off-duty that will come by, city workers off-duty that will come by. I think uh, one of the people that came by probably must work for the city because they one, one of the women in the group made the remark that what I, what I was doing was illegal. I was throwing stuff on the sidewalk. So, And I know people not just walking around quoting fucking ordinance violations. So she probably worked for the city or somebody that keeps up with what's going on online, which a lot of people do. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Just aware that that'll happen. They'll probably start being more interactions. I'm not going to delete the interactions. I hope the interactions aren't too long, but it's all part of the environment out here. And I want that to come across in these episodes. Uh... <clears throat> And I think that that's another reason why. Oh shoot! Try just drop the phone. Okay, that's another reason why I like to do these outside at City Hall as much as as often as possible because I want people to hear the type of interactions, the type of engagement that go on here. Uh, you can I don't know how much it will really be able to come across in the this episode, but it was a group of of drunk. Uh, I would say probably like third, 20, 20, late 20, early 30, 30s white people. Uh, it seemed like it was maybe six six women, two men, two or three men, something like that. They had passed by once before earlier today. And I think they might have even passed by yesterday as well. And they tried, They said some type of, uh, we have a, something written on the sidewalk that says uh, no more mass incarceration. And it rained, so it sort of faded. So they said something about no more ass, no more ass. I, was reading, so I just ignored them, or I think I was doing something, I ignored them. Uh, and I seen them on their way back over here again, and so I, I read and uh, did my best to 
uh, ignore them. And the woman, you know, comes by and what, what was she saying? She was trying to she was trying to mess me up while I was reading. I'm sure that, you know, she disagrees with the fuck the police is that they just walk by. Uh, that always gets people to fuck the police in chalk or some type of message written in chalk always sort of forces those people to to come out. They got to say something. And so uh, she did and she started trying to say what was the words that was on the book. She got all in my space, started touching on the book, the pages in the book, the letters in the book and stuff like that. And I think what, what's important is right before that, there was a group of what, uh, what looked like only white women. It might have been other races or other genders within there, but it looked like it was only white women. And they came by, they were very uh, nice, very supportive. And I think that's important to point out as well, too, because uh, the people who come out and are supportive and are understanding uh, far outnumber the people that come out and are obnoxious and, and egregious and racist. And then there's also a portion of people who come out and who just have genuinely have questions. And so she was sort of being like a passive aggressively antagonistic. Uh, she asked me what, what song do I like or something like that. And she was trying to, oh yeah, the, the Jack Harlow. Somebody had drove by listening to this Jack Harlow song. Uh, and so she was singing Jack Harlow lyrics. So I just thought that she should listen to Kendrick Lamar instead. And then one of the women in the group of friends behind her, that's when she, that prompted her to say, uh, Kendrick Lamar wouldn't read that book, <laughs> which is, I don't even know like how to respond to that. First off, the woman has no idea what book this is. I promise you it's, it's nighttime outside. She cannot read and see the title of the book. Uh, secondly, to think that this woman who lives in Rockford, Illinois, knows what uh, Kendrick Lamar, who is from a different state, culture, and in a, a completely different tax bracket is reading is just laughable. And I believe that's the same woman who said uh, he's storing stuff on the sidewalk. It's illegal. <laughs> okay. I wonder if she would have said he's, he's eating in the same restaurant with white people. It's illegal. All right, but let's let's read about. I don't, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize to Melissa V. Harris Perry and the people who came here to hear Sister Citizen and to enjoy a, a good Rafa reading episode. I sort of got to let myself get too sidetracked there, but I believe I handled the situation well. So as I read through this, what stands out to me is the experience that I had during the time that Hurricane Katrina was going on. And I think that was one of the first times I really was keeping up with uh, the news cycle. I was in a, I was one of the first times I was old enough to keep up with a news cycle. I would have been a, a freshman in high school. I remember like kids who were from New Orleans coming to school up here and living in hotels here. And uh, I remember just the impact that it had socially. And it was one of the first times I understood that Black people got treated differently at all these different levels. Like, it was a, a level of uh, racism and discrimination that I had never, like, considered. Like, uh, when natural disasters happen, how black people are living in areas where they have more chance to deal with natural disasters in, in portions of the city. And then also, when they happen there, that black people aren't helped in, or seen in the same way. One of the first times I've seen the way that the news media portrayed black people in comparison to how it portrayed white people as far as black people being considered looters and being considered, you know, these negative connotations and uh, white people would, would be on the same news uh, doing similar things and have more positive words with positive connotations attached to them, uh, survivors or something like that. And so uh, that was one of the my early teenage events of understanding of, of helping to s s mold my understanding of race uh, when I read about Hurricane Katrina. Then other than that I have never read this book that Melissa V. Harris is, Perry is speaking on but I have heard people talk about this book before. I feel like it might even have been a movie uh, let's see I want to keep going. Uh, I don't want to.
Don't want to quite end this episode there. See one second. Okay. All right. Uh, As in, as in Hurston's novel, the storm was a dispassionate and impersonal force, but its destruction was not shared equally. Before the storm. New Orleans was a predominantly African-American city, and those left in the wake of the hurricane were disproportionately black. Almost exclusively, it was the suffering of black people that was broadcast to a national viewing audience. Poor and black citizens found themselves both more vulnerable to the disaster and less able to recover in its aftermath. Even in the earliest days of this disaster, observers began to note the obvious racial inequality. During a live broadcast on CNN, Representative John Lewis, a senior member of the Congressional Black Caucus, asserted asserted that race was a critical factor influencing both media representations of the disaster and the responses of government officials. Lewis first gained national recognition decades earlier when he was brutally beaten while participating in a voting rights march in Selma, Alabama. The, quote, Bloody Sunday, end quote, demonstration was the catalyst leading to passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Throughout his distinguished career, Lewis has enjoyed assertive moral authority on issues of race. His fierce advocacy of domestic civil rights issues and his stance on international human rights concerns have earned him numerous awards, including the NAACP Spingarn Medal and the John F. Kennedy, quote, Profile in the Courage, end quote, Award for Lifetime Achievement. Even Republican opponents, like John McCain, have written of Lewis as an American of great integrity. In the immediate aftermath of Katrina, Lewis suggested that government officials were reacting inadequately because they considered the lives of black people unworthy of resources and action. The same argument was made more memorably on September 2, 2005, during a benefit concert. During a live broadcast on NBC, hip-hop artist Kanye West went off script, turned to the cameras, and said, quote, I hate the way they portray us in the media. You see a, back, a black family, it says, they're looting. You see a white family, it says, they're looking for food. And you know it's been five days waiting for federal help because most of the people are black. And even for me to complain about it, I will be a hypocrite because I've tried to turn away from the TV because it's too hard to watch. We already realize a lot of people that could help here are at war right now, fighting another way, and they've given them permission to go down and shoot us. George Bush doesn't care about black people. End quote. These comments churned up a second storm as members of the media, government, and military all sought to deny that race had played any part in the response. The racial aspects of the disaster became a flashpoint for disagreement between black and white Americans. More than five years later, George W. Bush recalled that moment Kanye West accused his administration of racist neglect of Katrina survivors, the lowest point of his presidency. Yet even as government officials made their denials, black Americans grew increasingly convinced that their government had abandoned them. In the days immediately following the flooding, a Pew Research Center public opinion survey revealed an enormous racial divide. While most Americans, 58 percent, felt depressed about the suffering caused by the storm, there were significant differences in how blacks and whites understood the failure to rescue survivors. Seventy percent of African Americans responded, reported being angry, but only 46 percent of whites were angry. Further. Over two-thirds of black respondents, 71 percent, versus only 32 percent of whites, believe that responses to the disaster show that racial inequality is still a major problem. A full 66 percent of blacks believe that the government would have responded faster if the victims were white, 
while only 17% of whites agreed. Okay, one second. I think we got a couple more paragraphs touching on Katrina, and then we'll read those, and then we'll wrap up this episode. All right, one second. Oh, drop the phone. We record these on record these episodes on the phone. I, I don't got no desk out here. Drop the phone. The entire nation grieved over the losses in New Orleans, but for black America, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina forced the question of whether people were truly American citizens worthy of fair treatment, swift response, and unchallenged rescue. Forced the question of whether black people were truly American citizens worthy of fair treatment, swift response, and unchallenged rescue. For black Americans, the disastrous consequences of wind and water were deepened by the initially slow and then surprisingly militaristic response to black suffering. Black Americans bristled as tens of thousands of African-American men, women and children were labeled, quote, refugees, end quote, by the U.S. media, as if the disaster had occurred not on American soil, but in a distant country. The refugee label had the effect of rhetorically removing black victims from national responsibility as though the consequences of the levy failure were to be endured by foreigners rather than Americans at the bottom of the same hierarchies of race and wealth that had contributed significantly to the disaster itself. As in Hurston's novel, it was these embedded racial wealth inequalities that allowed more white New Orleans to evacuate before the storm, to return swiftly to the city, and to rebuild in the months following the storm. As it was for Janie and Tea Cake in their hurricane, white residents in New Orleans occupied high ground while blacks sought refuge in the more dangerous territory below. And just as in Hurston's novel, racial hierarchies had life and death consequences. Okay. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and end this in this episode here. And I want you to please share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on. And uh, I think my first impressions of, I love the the writing and the manner of writing that she's doing already. I love the way that she's, uh, I love the way that Melissa is diving into Katrina and uh, expounding upon the political the political connotations that exist in the way that Katrina was handled by both the media and by the government. And I think that I can't look, I can't wait for the other things that we have uh, to read uh, from, from here on out. And I think that that's one of the things that maybe we have not talked about that I would like to at least add here and say here. So that way it's out into the, it's out. We have it as part of the curriculum or the, the audio studies is that, the way that black people deal with natural or black people experience natural disasters in this country when it comes to weather, the people who are, who live in cities and in areas and cities where they're more likely to deal with tornadoes or they're more likely to deal with hurricanes or they're more likely to deal with floods, the way that uh, certain areas get received help after floods and uh, tornadoes and things like that. That's also an aspect of, our society and our country that bears question asking and looking into the way that FEMA works. I remember Katrina happening and it was a lot of questions of the justness of FEMA FEMA. and uh, in the event Hurricane Katrina itself. I know that we have in Black Lives, uh, in the book we first began this podcast series reading, Have Black Lives Ever Mattered? I believe Mami Abu-Jamal brought up Hurricane Katrina and some of the implications that existed in Hurricane Katrina. And I think maybe one other book that we've read in some way touched on Hurricane Katrina. But I do think that is a very important moment in in American history and specifically in black American history to uh, to understanding where we are at currently. There are certain moments that have happened in the 21st century that sort of illustrate just how far back we are 
on race relations in this country and how deeply rooted racism is in this country. And Hurricane Katrina is one of those moments. So please share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with another episode of Rafa Reading Daily, and we will continue reading Sister Citizen by Melissa V. Harris Perry. Remember, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide you the opportunity to begin or further your journey in the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. Talk to you tomorrow. We outside.